the basic version of the perceptron has this input layer that that contains one input neuron for each one of the uh, dimensions of our input. So if we have a set of d-dimensional data points, we have um, one uh, input neuron for each one of these um, uh, components, and that makes up the input layer. And the uh, perceptron, uh, what it does is it it has um, a computational uh, unit here. This this is the uh, output neuron, and it does a linear combination of these uh, inputs, um, and that's drawn visually with the synapses and we have the uh, weights um, for each one of these uh, uh, synapses. And there is also the free term uh, that in this model is um, Im implemented as an additional input. Um, I'm, denoting I'm denoting this by x0 and that always has a value of 1. So that's also fed to this um, uh, basic uh, version of the perceptron. Now the perceptron in this form is a very limited model. It can only learn uh, linear models. Whether you do uh, regression, then it's a linear regression problem, or whether you do classification, then it's a uh, logistic um, uh, regression problem. And that means that it's very limited in its learning power. Now, to address this thing, we can also imagine that, in fact, these perceptrons are feeding into each other. So, in fact, this um, neuron we have here, um, this one, would in fact feed in to another layer of, of neuron. So, this means that we would have more than just one neuron here. This would be just the first one. And in fact, we would have quite a number of such neurons here. And let's say that we have H such neurons. And each one of them is connected to the uh, input layer and in implements its own computation, meaning that uh, it has its own specific set of um, weights. And these neurons now, in turn, they feed in to a second layer of neurons. And these, in fact, are going to be um, our uh, output neurons. So we would have um, a neuron Y1 and maybe we have a number of these, maybe we have um, you know, uh, say capital K, uh, such neurons. And they all get as inputs the values of the neurons from this uh, intermediary, uh, intermediate layer. And there would be uh, a layer of weights uh, and uh, each one of these synapses would have uh, its own weight. Now, we also need to account for the linear term in each one of these uh, perceptrons. So we have this additional neuron here, I'm denoting this by Z0, and this always has value 1, and this also feeds in as uh, the free term in each one of these computations. So we have a second layer of uh, weights. If these were, uh, for example, the um, uh, Wij, this would be um, V, um, and maybe I'm using, uh, say, Rs. Um, so there would be now two layers of weights and two layers of um, uh, perceptrons. This would be the hidden layer. Um, and this would be the output layer. And I want to tell you how the computation goes uh, in, in such a two layer uh, perceptron. Uh, First, just to clarify, the input layer is not really considered as a layer in itself in the sense that there is no computation happening in this one. So this is the first layer and this is the so-called hidden layer because it corresponds to some internal calculations that are done by this um, multi-layer percep perceptron. And this is the output or the second layer uh, of, um, of perceptrons. And as a matter of fact, this idea could also be composed. We could have additional layers in here and in that case, we would get a so-called deeper networks. And that's exactly the uh, topic that we are going to come back to in the next unit of lectures when we discuss about deep learning. But in this, um, uh, you know, two layer uh, perceptrons or uh, a perceptor, perceptron with just one uh, hidden layer, I would like to show you how the computation is being done.
So the input layer feeds into the hidden layer and this hidden layer is going to do the usual linear computation that's associated to a perceptron. And we are going to think about this in terms of these neurons from the hidden layer or the perceptrons from the hidden layer, whether they are activated or not. And, and that's going to be achieved um, in the way that we were doing classification with perceptrons. It's going to be achieved through um, uh, applying a sigmoid function to these linear computations. Um, sometimes people also think about it in, in this way that there is a computational layer and then there is um, a separate uh, activation layer that applies the sigmoid function. I'm going to combine both the computation and the idea of the activation into the same single hidden layer. But sometimes it's useful, conceptually speaking, to think also in terms of having a linear computation and a um, non-linear um, sigmoid type of um, activation layer. So um, we we have this um, uh, idea of that, that these neurons or the perceptrons from the hidden layer are being uh, activated or not through the sigmoid function applied to, to, to this um, uh, linear combination of the uh, inputs. And that in effect is a, um, a sort of a non-linear transformation of the uh, input into this uh, h-dimensional uh, space um, uh, that, that corresponds to the hidden layer. And then in the second layer we have the output layer uh, computing its own linear model in terms of the hidden layer. And, and I want to stress this, it's linear in the hidden layer. It's, it's certainly non-linear if you think in terms of the input layer, but these perceptrons are just going to implement their own linear computation in terms of the um, values offered by the uh, hidden layer. And, and then they are going to uh, output the values depending on what kind of problems they are trying to solve. It's, if it's a uh, regression problem, then they just output this uh, linear combination of the hidden layer. If it's a uh, classification problem, they will uh, output uh, their sigmoid-based or softmax-based um, um, uh, values, depending on the um, whether you solve a binary classification or a multi-class classification problem. So just to open this in somewhat more details, the idea is that the hidden layer is going to do a computation of this type. Each one of the um, neurons or the perceptrons from the hidden layer is going to do a computation like this. It's a sigmoid, it's a ZH is a sigmoid function applied to such a computation. It's uh, its own specific set of um, uh, weights or, or its own specific weight vector applied to the input uh, X. And, and that, as we um, discussed uh, many times uh, before, is corresponds to this uh, 1 over 1 plus and is the exponential applied to uh, minus sum. And I want to just um, open this up for you uh, so that I introduce the notation for each one of these uh, uh, synaptic weights. So it's just a sum um, running from, um, I'm writing it from 0 to D and it's the uh, WHJ times XJ. And obviously remember that X0 is always equal to 1. So that's the, uh, that's the calculation done by the hidden layer in each one of the neurons from the uh, hidden layer. And um, again, the idea is that you have this linear combination of the inputs and then to get the activation status of each one of the uh, neurons, you apply the sigmoid function. And then the output layer um, is going to perform the usual computation done by the perceptrons. Uh, so in the output layer, we simply have this calculation yi is equal to, um, they have their own set of weights um, and so it's this specific vector of weights corresponding to neuron uh, i and it's vi transpose times um, z and that's the vector coming from the hidden layer. So uh, this is um, a sum just to uh, open up the dimensionality of this uh, calculation. It's a sum from 1 to uh, capital H, the number of neurons in the hidden layer by vi h times, and in fact, I'm, I'm going to put it from zero so that I have a, 
um, uniform, uniform way of writing this times z, zh and obviously remember that z0 is always uh, going to be equal to, uh, to 1. This output layer, if um, if it's addressing a classification problem, obviously is going to have an additional calculation here in terms of the uh, sigmoid uh, function or the softmax function. But I'm skipping that because the essential part of that calculation is in this linear combination of the values coming from the hidden layer. I want to discuss a little bit more the calculation done by this hidden layer. So. Once again, there is this linear component of the calculation done in the hidden layer plus the non-linear part of it in terms of the activation calculation of this hidden layer. Now, this activation part is crucial. If we didn't have that um, activation part, then all this calculation done in these two layers is going to be a linear calculation following another linear calculation and obviously that altogether would be just one one bigger linear calculation. In other words, this would be just a one single layer type of uh, perceptron. So the whole idea of composing and adding layers to the perceptron um, would collapse. So the non-linear part, the non-linear activation is essential in, in gaining power um, with the perceptrons. We have achieved, we have achieved this um, non-linear activation through the sigmoid function. And I just want to point out that there are also other possibilities for um, other activation functions to be used in such hidden layers. And one idea is that we could use the uh, hyperbolic tangent function. Um, and the only difference is that that one is going to range from minus one to one instead of range, ranging from zero to one as the sigmoid function does. And uh, it depends on the kind of data you might have, whether you are tempted to use uh, a range of values from minus one to one or from zero to one. But most often in practice, it doesn't really make much of a difference if you use uh, the hyperbolic tangent or the uh, sigmoid function. There is another option of choosing an activation function in terms of the uh, rectified linear unit or ReLU unit. And that's something that we are going to discuss much more um, when we go to deep learning, when we have um, more such hidden layers. Um, and still another possibility is the uh, Gaussian, which is using the Euclidean distance instead of the uh, dot product for the similarity between two vectors. Um, and that's also something that we might come back to in one of the uh, later uh, units.